separate parts of the show. This is the only reason I said yes to covering this, because I get a free drink and I'm a northerner. And when there is free alcohol, we're there, what can I say? And tonight there is a man appearing that has been basically begging to come on the show with me for weeks, months. Every night I say, no, you cannot. Um, but tonight I decided to make an exception. I speak of the businessman extraordinaire who made millions, 80 million in fact, by the age of 31 in the field of mobile phones. He was the first, youngish should I say, uh, person to ever own a Premier League football club. And he's done huge amounts ever since. Restaurants, films, properties, you name it. Uh, his highlight of his life is living with me. <laughs> Isn't it? Simon Indeed. Jordan. Indeed. Uh, I've managed all the time, haven't I? You asked to come on this show, Jubes and Co. with me. Yeah, if asking to come on this show is equivalent to saying, not if you tied my tongue to the back of a bus and dragged me here, then I guess, yes, asking on the show is what I wanted to do. Simon Jordan, good evening to you. Just do a nice little cheers. Nice to see you. Uh, Simon's got a gin and tonic. I'm from is, home. Yeah, the worst looking gin and tonic mm. I've ever seen in my life. Mm. Apologies for that. No lemon. Uh, tell me, yeah, no lemon. I mean, Enough what's going on here? No lemon for Enough Simon of the one Jordan. Opposite me. Um, Simon, Tell me. you know, you made, I've got it written here, £80 million uh, pounds by the age of 31. How did you do that? Um, by being effective in the industry that I was in, by having a lot of ambition, a lot of determination, knowing what I was doing, working hard and taking advantage of an industry that lent itself to enormous growth. You know, it was, a, it was an interesting time. I was very ambitious. I was very focused. I was young, but I was also um, aware enough of how the world is held together having been in businesses before, having had failures before. People talk about successes in life and all the achievements they have. And I've seen a lot of people come on here, mates of mine like Theo Pafitis, and they talk about the things that they do in their lives. But success is like an iceberg. All the rubbish and all the failures are beneath the surface and all the things that you do well are the things that you see above it. So you take lots of things from successes and failures, and failure builds up the ability to overcome adversity. So how I did it was an industry that lent itself to that sort of growth. I built 250 shops in five years, never borrowed any money, never had any investors, never had an overdraft, but just had an innate ability to be able to maximise the industry that I was in. And of course, I had good people working alongside me, a good staff, and I was a motivated leader. So all of that afforded an opportunity. And I had the wherewithal at the time to be able to capitalise on it. And what did you do once you'd capitalised? Once you've got this big bag of money, what then? Well, it's one of those things I often debate about equitable swaps, you know, the idea of, of cashing in. I never really wanted to sell the business, but one of my shareholders, that was one of my startup partners, was very keen to want to sell, and he'd been keen to sell for some time. And because of the construction of equity in our business, it made it slightly more incumbent upon me to do so. So I looked at it and thought, the industry is, is probably at its peak now in terms of Businesses like mine that have started up, that run hard and fast and really run for the finishing line of being successful. And there was an opportunity. So I took it, I sold it, I swapped it for a bag of cash. Now, that's the equitability side of things, because one of the things you do, if you do things for success, money is, is, a, is, a, is a caveat and it's a qualification. But for me, it was never the benchmark. So I needed something else to inspire me, motivate me and challenge me. So I figured I'd have this sort of Dr. Pepper moment. How difficult can it be? I know. I'll buy the football club that my father used to play for. So I decided that that was the way to go, to buy a football club, because I had a, a sportsman's mentality, having had a father that played football, having been in and around football myself and been on the books of various professional football clubs, Chelsea and Crystal Palace included. And I just thought it was the right time, with a balance of ego and ambition and wanting to make sure everyone knew that I'd been successful, that a football club might lend itself to my personality and my drive. And it was also at a time when that industry was going like that in terms of broadcast deals and the opportunity for football to be a proper, mature industry was beginning, beginning to manifest itself. And, you know, it's, you talk about football and, you know, I'm reliably informed um, that frequently... Uh, fans, opposing fans, would sing to you in yes, stands in a indeed. not very flattering manner. So, for example, I hear that they would sing, Simon Jordan is a beep, is a mm. beep. We live in a society now, Simon, yep. where kind of offence and being offensive, you know, you can't say certain things. Sure. And I wonder, you know, you have been hated 
by many football fans called names, as I just no, explained. No, that's not true. I mean, tr football is very tribalistic. And I was a very young owner and I was very in your face, you know, and I had very strong opinions. I wasn't interested in the backdrop of the nonsense that went before and all the self-serving drivel that I thought football perpetuated. I was going to make sure that my point was heard, heard. I was also in a very high profile set of circumstances in my life from the business in, um, that I invested in to the people that I hung around with. And so it brought me to the fore. And when things happened, I didn't pull away. I didn't pull any punches. I, I wasn't political in my views. If, if, if Birmingham City wanted to nick my football manager, which they did, I was very strident about my attitude towards Birmingham, saying things like, why would he want to go there? What's the best thing about Birmingham, the road out? Why would he go to a club that's never been in the Premier League? What was the last thing that Birmingham had ever won? Uh, nothing. So that's going to make you, uh, with people, slightly unpopular with certain segments of their fan bases. But also, in the football fraternity, what people knew was I said what I meant, and I meant what I said, and I also had the courage of my convictions. That's why managers that mucked about with me got injunctions put against them. That's why managers that tried to tell in lies... In quite spectacular got... ways, by the way. Yeah. Is it Ian Dowie? Yep. Yeah. That, was a, that was a writ. That was a writ. That was my sort of Lee Harvey Oswald moment for TV. You know, they talk about Lee Harvey Oswald being shot in America, never turning TV off after that because they would have missed something. I served a writ on a press conference for a manager that had lied to me about wanting to leave the club to move back to the north and actually ended up about two miles down the road to one of our biggest rivals. So I think he thought he was funny and I think he thought he was clever trying or uh, uh, artificially manufacturing a situation with a million pound compensation that we were due to be paid would be obviated by me allowing him out his contract on goodwill. He thought that was clever. So served him with a writ live on television, then took him to court and then got him convicted for fraudulent misrepresentation, which is the hardest case to prove. So people took that with both measures of, OK, you can be a little bit of a Flash Herbert sometimes and a little bit, you know, you live in Spain, you've always got a tan, your hair was blonde and you drive oh, a Ferrari. Funny you mention your hair. Let's look at your hair, by the way, as we're talking. Got some pictures of your great hair. Look at that. Why would you do such a thing? Tre tre it's, called, it's, no, it's called treachery. Let me yeah. be clear. Yeah. I was just about to say you got off lightly because some yeah. of the states of your hair, I mean, yeah. good grief. I, got a, I had to yeah. find pictures that I could actually use. I mean, what on, what on God's green earth was you thinking? Look at that. Well, the tragedy of it is, is my mother works in the beauty industry and she was spending a lot of time talking to me about my hair and I thought at the time it was the look. Pete I did OK, good. Michelle. That's not you, is it? Yeah, that's me and Trevor Sinclair. That's you? Yeah. Goodness gracious. Well, that's me. me after I met you. So I look haggard, drawn, beaten up and ready to fall over. You look awful. I've not... Like, like I just said. Very off-putting. Um, anyway, yeah. you work now, uh, you do a lot of things now, but sure. one of the things you do is in the media. Yes, now, I do. I find it fascinating because like you, my background's not particularly media. I find myself in the media. Yep. I wonder, what, what kind of, what role do you think the media plays in this country? Do you think it's a force for good? Um, I have mixed emotions about it because I think mainstream media is in a very invidious position because social media drives the agenda and mainstream media comes in and colours the gaps in now. So it has to run along a certain parameter. Also, with the advent of 24-hour rolling news, which I think is one of the greatest evils because it's a content-driven business where it needs to keep on driving content and self-perpetuating, you need to have 15 different epidemiologists on to be able to contradict one another so the next news cycle can be fed during COVID. We need to have 15 different economic guys on to argue about the pros and cons of inflation so that media cycles can drive their content and then can drive their advertising revenues and, f you know, fulfill their model. Um, you know, I do think, and it's an irony that I sit inside the media, but I'm quite privileged because I can sit inside the media and within reason, I can say what I want and get away of saying what I want within reason. Because there is an element of responsibility. You can't run around saying exactly what you please, not just because of Ofcom guidelines, but because you can't and you shouldn't. There should be some form of responsibility behind what you do and don't really? say. Really? So people shouldn't be able to say? Do you think people have got a right not to be offended? No. I think it depends what you take offence at. I mean, I do think one of the... The byproducts of our society is a lack of resilience, and I do think people should remember that when people call them names, then most of the time they're total strangers. As you have pointed out, I had 25,000 fans inside football stadiums that didn't like me calling me rude names. I'm in the mindset, and maybe it's generational, there's only one thing worse than people talking about you is people not talking about you. So I take that sort of mindset, and I don't really care about the opinions of total strangers. When it becomes the opinions of valued peers and you're overreaching and your grasp is being exceeded by your reach, then you should think about some of the things you say. But I do sit there. I sit here watching news channels. I watch your channel. I watch the Sky News of the World and other people and Sky Sports and want to put my foot through the television for some of the... What? Shut up. That's not your... Some of the, for some of the disingenuity don't... and duplicity and double standards and lack of education, lack of awareness and binary thoughts 
because nothing is binary. We don't live in this world where there's no nuance and it doesn't seem to be a propensity or desire for nuance to be part of any conversation, whether it's COVID, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's economics, whether it's Brexit. Why do you think that is? Because I think people are entranced in their positions. They don't understand how to debate things. They don't have an open mind. They don't want to have an open mind. And there's agendas. If you look at the, if you look at some of the biases through the last two years about the manner in which certain broadcasters have represented information, if you look at the way that the Brexit situation, be for it or against it, if you look at the BBC for the way they advance Brexit, every time you went on to a TV show like Question Time, which I did, you would find yourself on there with three Remainers and one Brexiteer. That's not a balanced conversation. That's a weighted dialogue. So I, I do feel that broadcasting lacks responsibility.